time. We've had three presentations from clinicians, although I'm doubting whether some of them really are clinicians. I think they've jumped to the other side, but anyway. We now move on from an equity point of view to hear from people with the lived experience. And I know as an advocate in this space, there's many of you out there that struggle with the label of the term consumer and the label of the term carer. Particularly if you're a mum, if you're a child of a parent, you don't like that label, it's just something that you do out of the love of what you do. And if you're a consumer, you don't pop down to Safeway to buy a kilo of, you know, BPD. So, you know, without getting hung up on the language of the words of consumer and carer, what we want to do now is have two presentations by people with the lived experience. And in the lived experience comes an expertise that adds to the expertise of those that study through research and evidence what is and isn't working. All means to the end are relevant and very warranted. So I'd like to introduce our first person who is going to be our consumer keynote. And I'd like to introduce you to Catherine Bennett and I'd like you to absolutely let her know that coming to a stage, sharing something of yourself of such a personal nature takes great tenacity, courage, but out of that comes a sense that the rest of us, that are, when we're ready, want to share our story, can do it as well, okay? So can we thank Catherine, please, in advance. Sitting down the front, I didn't realise how many people there were. I'm now scared. <laughs> I'll go slow. Okay, so why am I here? My first decision was I'm going to tell you my story from beginning to end, how I got to be diagnosed and what recovery looks like for me. But then I thought you have your own stories. Why listen to someone else's when you're struggling with your own? So I'm going to give you a brief, very brief introduction to why I'm here and then we'll talk about what it is to live with BPD and some of the things that work and don't work. Because today we're looking at what works. So I'm going to cover those two things of what doesn't work and what does. So to start with, why am I here? After years of domestic violence, sexual assault, rape, dangerous, dangerous destructive behaviours, domestic violence and 14 suicide attempts, I was diagnosed with BPD. I met all nine of the nine criteria and was told that I would be hospitalised for most of my life because I was chronic and I would never recover. That was the message I received. That's when I first heard the term BPD. Now I looked up the internet, went to Google, did my special Google search. Do you know what BPD stands for, the very first result that comes up? British Petroleum Distribute the hell does that have to do with me? So I kept searching and I found very intelligent websites from America for carers about people with BPD. Their partners who are evil, who need to be locked up. Family members who told other family members to run as fast as you can. If this person has BPD, they are evil and you need to stay away from them. This confirmed everything I believed about myself. Yes, I have evil in my heart. Yes, I am dangerous to society. Yes, I don't deserve to live. That evil BPD was living within me. And that was confirmed. It also confirmed what I had heard most of my life. You're a psycho and you deserve to be locked up. That was me. That was my introduction. So prior to being diagnosed in, with BPD in 2004, I was diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder, major depression, major depression disorder, social anxiety disorder, and bulimia. I had a range of illnesses, but no one said BPD. 
until 2004. What is the fight for recovery? The fight for recovery is an interesting one. It's a fight that you fight with yourself. No one else can do it for you. It's a fight you do for you. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. And to survive, I had to do it. I didn't have a choice anymore. If I wanted to survive, I had to fight. The battle is a long, lonely road. In 2008, I walked from Newcastle to Melbourne to raise awareness of BPD. That was a long walk, that was lonely, but nothing like the fight to recover. It's painful, challenging, frustrating, mostly frustrating. And with every stumbling step to get to where I am, it was worth it. It was worth the fight. All those days, all those nights, all those times of self-harm, of crying, of begging to God to please just let me die. It was worth it. I completed dialectical behaviour therapy, DBT, in 2004 and 2005. Nothing changed in the first three years completing DBT. Nothing. It wasn't the therapy, it was me. I was too lazy and too damn stubborn to change anything. I didn't want to change anything. I didn't want to accept that it was my fight. I didn't cause BPD, so I shouldn't have to do it. And the answer I got was, yes, but you're the one suffering. Now, I was told by a support person who had been supporting me for four years to get off my butt and do it because he had had enough. So out of spite, I decided, fine, I'll show you. I'll show you what I can do. That's my stubborn nature. I took on the challenge and I fought with everything within me. And things started to change. Things started very slowly to make sense. So I reached remission. Now remission is meeting no more than two of the criteria. It's not recovery. Remission is having every unhealthy behaviour, thought, emotion stripped away until you are blank. I had nothing left. All my manipulative behaviours, all my backstabbing and arguing and emotional outbursts, they were gone. My self-harming was gone. My suicide attempts were gone. I had nothing left. That's re remission. And as frightening as that is, that was the happiest I had ever been in my life. I had achieved remission. Then the real fight starts, where you fight for recovery. Fighting for recovery is building a life worth living. It's fighting for yourself, fighting to learn who you are, what you want in life. My fight was to find out that I'm a caring and compassionate person, and that's not a weakness. That was a tough lesson to learn, that I can be compassionate and loving to others without them hurting me, without expecting them to hurt me. I learnt who I am. That's when I reached functional recovery. A life worth living. I was functioning in life. I'm now the same as everyone else in the world. I just got here a different way. But after reaching recovery comes another, another battle. I'd recovered from BPD. Then I had to recover from having BPD. I had to learn the things that most people know. Hands up anyone who is manipulative. Hands up if you've ever called anyone with BPD manipulative. It's a normal human behaviour. Everyone in the world manipulates. It took me a long time to learn that. Every time I, I had gone out and manipulated someone to get, some, to get them to do something for me, I thought, oh, the BPD's back, I'm falling apart, I have to go back in hospital. No, it's a normal human behaviour. Getting angry inappropriately. Like this morning when that idiot cut me off. Oh. Normal human behaviour. That's the final fight. To recover from having BPD.
This part is for carers, family members, partners, clinicians, mental health workers, those who have chosen or not to take on the role of caring and supporting someone with BPD. This message is for you and only you. You are the most important person in your life. You, the most important person in your life. You need to stay safe, functional, and well, sane in a lot of trauma. And that's a hard job, a very hard job. First and foremost, you need to take care of yourself. Whatever that takes, you need to take care of yourself. Your role as carer, supporter, is important to us. It means a lot to us. You may never hear that. You may never feel that. But I can promise you, you as carer, supporter, means a lot to us. So you need to take care of you. One of the ways of doing that is having boundaries. Boundaries are the key to any relationship, but they are most important for those with BPD. We will test them, push them and cross them as much as you let us. Don't let us. Don't let us do that to you. Stand your ground. Hard work, yes. It's easy for me to stand here and say it, but that's hard work, but that will keep you safe. The fallout of setting and maintaining boundaries is arguments, anger, and very unhealthy behaviours. But if you stick with your boundaries, stick with your healthy boundaries, the person you are caring for will respect you and trust you. That will keep you safe. Acceptance. This is not approval. Do not approve of our behaviours, but accept that we are doing our best and we need to do better. Also accept the person you, have, you are caring for who has a mental illness, they struggle every day of their life. We need you to know that we react to things poorly. We react to what we think about life, to others and ourselves. And the biggest struggle is survival. So accepting that sometimes we will hurt ourselves and we will hurt you, which you may never understand, and I'm sure you will never get used to. But know that you can believe in us. We need you to believe in recovery, and we need you to believe in us. Empathy is not sympathy. Having sympathy for someone is very different to trying to understand that they've been triggered and they're reacting the best they can. And that must be bloody hard. And it is. It is hard. It's a hell of a life to live. Empathy is learning about the things that trigger us. Understanding that our reaction is intense, but it's an intense version of how you would react to, to a trigger. Understand how you would feel with that intensity. How would you cope with that influx of emotions that won't go away? Those thoughts that tear you down. Those behaviours that bring so much shame. How would you live with that? That is empathy. And that will help you to understand. That will help you to keep safe. But you also need to let us know that you're not scared of our emotions. We need you to be tough. Most of us are scared of our emotions. We're scared of what they do to us. We need to know that you are not disgusted by our emotions. That's a big thing that will help. And finally, and this is a point that I push for every carer, clinician, mental health worker, honesty. Please be honest. We know there's a lot of things you need to hide. We get that. Some don't. Some do. Those of us who do, we get that. Be open and honest in your discussions. Your questions, especially your questions, and the way you share your experience with the issues that you are struggling with. 
We need to know that you're struggling too, because we don't. A lot of us lack that empathy. We didn't develop that skill. We must have been hiding behind the door when it was handed out. We try, we do our best, but be honest with us. That's what we need. Learn everything you can about BPD. Remission, recovery, and then ask questions. And then ask more questions. Ask as many as you need to to get the answers you need to have to help us. Talk about BPD as an illness. It is a mental illness. It's not a lifestyle choice. No one in the world ever chose to have a mental illness. Talk about BPD as an illness. And be honest with yourself too. That's important. Have your own honesty. If you need time out, recognise that, respect that and do something about it. If you need love, that's okay. You can ask for that. You have a right for that. Because you are the most important person in your life. I often struggle with what to call people with BPD, apart from clearly people. Consumer, patient, client, participant, a person, an individual with BPD. For me, it's Catherine. That's enough for me. Catherine will do. First of all, I'm going to tell you what doesn't work. Because not many people will tell you what doesn't work. So we just go about doing the things that we do, hoping things are going to change. So what doesn't work? Giving up. Giving up does not work. And I'm not just talking about suicide. Clearly that doesn't work. What I'm talking about is pushing away those who care for you. That is giving up on yourself. Self-harming instead of talking openly and honestly. That is giving up on yourself. Blaming others for the behaviour you choose because you've been triggered. That is giving up on yourself. And choosing to not go to therapy, not follow the roles of therapy, or not doing everything within your power to get to therapy. Find it, pay for it, beg for it, steal it. Get to therapy. And if you don't, that is giving up on yourself. These things have never worked in the past. They won't work in the future either. And if it doesn't work, change it. If it's not working for you, fight. Change it. Giving in also doesn't work. Giving in is listening to those urges and thoughts that you want to do unhealthy things and acting on them instead of talking about them, instead of sharing them, crying about them, yelling about them. Fight the urges. They're in your head. Thoughts are not fact. Urges are not fact. Emotions are not fact. Find the courage to fight them. Never give in. I was told this very brief piece of information on Monday night when I was running a support group. I had my support person help run the support group and one of the posters he put up was very interesting and it said, you own BPD. It doesn't own you. That's something I didn't know when I was unwell. I believed it owned me. Now I see that it never did. It was always within my choice, within my power to make those changes. You own BPD. It doesn't own you. One way of not giving in and not giving up is to just stop. Stop and think. What do I need to do? What needs to happen here for me to be okay? 
Do I need to yell? Do I need to cry? Do I need to write? Do I need to paint? No, I can't paint. There needs to be something other than giving in or giving up. That's the choice you get to make. A hard choice. One that you will not always succeed at making. One that in the beginning you will rarely succeed at making. But it's still a choice. Are you going to give up? Fight? Give in? Continue the struggle? Or save yourself? Aside from therapy, as we've heard previously, what does actually work? Being willing to fight, but also willing to fall apart. This is not an easy road. It's painful, frustrating, confusing, and most of all, the hardest thing you will ever do in your life. One promise I can make to you, and I make this promise as a sincere promise, it's worth it. The fight is worth it. The freedom you get from fighting is worth the fight. It's worth all the struggling to be free. Be willing to read everything you can about BPD and others' experiences and be willing to talk about it with anyone and everyone when you are ready. In the beginning, I didn't talk about BPD. It was depression. That's it, just depression. And then I learnt that people didn't understand why I was suffering. Other friends had depression and they didn't self-harm. Other friends had depression and they didn't see the world in black and white. They didn't suffer and get triggered the way I did. So I started talking. Oh, I have BPD. What's that? Oh, OK, yeah, we need to talk about that. Get as much information as you can. And when you're ready, start talking. Start being honest about an illness that you have, not an illness that you are, because you are not BPD. You are not borderline. You are not borderline personality. You have an illness. The same as I have asthma. It's an illness that needs to be treated. Be willing. That's an important step to take. Be willing also to lose everything to achieve recovery. What I thought was the most dear things in my life were the things that were hurting me. And the friends who I thought were the most compassionate left me. I had to be willing to lose anything and everything to achieve recovery. And those losses were worth it because I am in a better place. I lost family, I lost friends, I lost all the behaviours that I thought were keeping me safe. That's the fight. And all those things were worth it. Be willing to let go. Now, it takes a hell of a lot of courage to fight the illness. It takes a lot of courage to heal and recover. It takes strength to know when to change and when to make those changes. To know what, when you need to rest and to take that rest. To know when to ask for help and actually seek that help out. That takes courage. Being honest with yourself. Everyone in the world lies to themselves. Unfortunately, we're better at it. Stop. You deserve better. You deserve to be honest with yourself. That works. Start treating yourself with love and respect. Not because I tell you to, not because DBT says it's a great thing to do, but because in your heart you know you deserve it. Deep down in your soul you know you deserve love and respect from yourself. Fight for that. Never give up. Never give in. Be willing to fight, change, and live a life worth living. 
and trust your courage. It got you this far. It got you here today. Trust your courage. So what does recovery feel like? This is my website. After eight years of intensive therapy, I achieved functional recovery, walked away and said I will never discuss BPD again. Ever. And that kind of didn't work out that way. I realised that there's a gap. People don't know about BPD. People don't know about recovery, about fighting, about living with the pain and the horror of not knowing who you are. That's when I needed to share. I run a support group in the city once a month. It's for those with BPD. It's to give them a place to go, a place to talk with others, to share, to struggle and to support. We come together and we care for each other. And I like that I can give that to people because I fought for myself. The website has a message board for support for people with BPD. Support and understanding is the goal on the message board. Recovery is the individual goal. I'm in my third year at university studying psychology. I was consumer advisor for Spectrum, the personality disorder service for Victoria for 18 months. And I'm now consumer consultant for the Alfred Psychiatry where we promote recovery oriented practice. Clinicians who fight for recovery. And I get to tell them how to do it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I have an amazing support person who's been there for 11 years. He has never walked away. That's one of the reasons I recovered. I had someone who was never going to give up on me. I have beautiful friends who are amazing and very supportive. They know my history. They know my past and they love me for it. I now have support from my family, which is a big thing for me, considering that I didn't speak to them for nine years. I have them back in my life again. Recovery bought that for me. And I have a life worth living. Many people ask me, what would you change out of all the things, the sexual assault, the domestic violence, the self-harm, the illness itself, what would you change? I wouldn't change any of it. If I changed even one little thing, I wouldn't know what I know now. I wouldn't be able to share this with you today and plead with you to fight. I wouldn't change any of it. I wouldn't live through it again, that's for sure. But I wouldn't change any of it. And the thing that I'm going to leave you with is the goal of recovery. I wouldn't give up this life for anything. And I am so pleased that my attempts at suicide did not work. Recovery is worth it. No matter what you have to do to get there, recovery is worth it. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, can you be hugged by a stranger? Yes. Always. <laughs> Thank you so, 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 so much. Thank you. Just stay here for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, this turning out. <laughs> the old saying of uh, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. We only know that's possible if you're willing to take yours off first, to put theirs on. And for me, this was the closest experience and gift of knowledge that I have experienced of the reality of borderline personality disorder. And it is a gift. Every one of us today has been in a place and a time where we were gifted with knowledge. So when you let the rest of life get in your way with nonsense, just know that there are people around with gifts to give such as this. Catherine, I just, um, again, 
profoundly from the depth of my heart on behalf of every single person in this room, just want to say thank you. The skill, the knowledge, the courage, the fight, the bloody tenacity woman <laughs> is just, is just um, sort of beyond the words. And we're really glad you're here still. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.